It is now time for oral questions. I recognize the Leader of His Majesty's loyal opposition. Thank you, Speaker. Good morning. Uh, last week, I was shocked to hear the Minister of Health say that the recruitment and retention of family doctors was not a major concern. Wow. That's her quote. Not a major concern. A quarter of patients in Sault Ste. Marie without a family doctor. Not a major concern. 30,000 patients in Kingston without access to primary care. Not a major concern? These comments are not only insensitive, considering the 2.2 million people in this province without a family physician, they are dangerous. So I will ask the Premier, will he stand by the Minister's dangerous and insensitive comments? The Parliamentary Assistant Member for Stormont, Dundas, so Clint Gary. Thank you, Speaker. Since 2018, we've registered over 12,500 new physicians in Ontario, with almost 10 per cent of those being family physicians. We've also registered 80,000 new nurses and 2,400 new doctors last year alone. Speaker, last year was a record-breaking year for nurses. We registered over 17,500 new nurses last year. Speaker, we've registered over 33,000 new nurses in the last two years, and we have another 30,000 nurses that are enrolled and studying at a university or college in Ontario. Speaker, but we are not stopping there. We want this year to be another record year. Speaker, we're investing another $740 million to address the immediate staffing needs, supporting the expansion of over 3,000 new nursing seats at Ontario colleges and universities. Speaker, we'll continue to do what's needed to ensure Response. that the people of Ontario have the best publicly funded health care when and where they need it. Supplementary question. Speaker, people are being diagnosed with cancer these days, not in the comfort and safety of their family doctor's office, but in an overcrowded emergency room. Emergency room physicians are diagnosing cancers more and more often because they are facing so many patients coming to emergency rooms who don't have access to primary care at all. Imagine, imagine being in an emergency room. You go there because you've had these problems, you've been putting it off because you, you don't have a family doctor, and then you sit there and you are told, not only do you have cancer, but that it's metastasized in an emergency room. I want to ask the Premier again to stand in this place and tell us whether he is going to continue to stand by his health minister's insensitive comments. Speaker, Ontario is leading the way when it comes to cancer care in the nation, but we know there is more to be done. Speaker, Ontario is also leading the country with almost 90 per cent of Ontarians having access to a family doctor or primary health care provider. So, Speaker, we do know there's more to be done. Since 2018, as we've stated many times in this House, we've registered 12,000 500 new physicians, with 10 per cent of those being family doctors. Speaker, just one year after our government's launch, our Your Health Plan, we're making steady progress to connect more people to convenient care. Speaker, we started the year with an investment of $110 million to uh, create 78 new and expanded interprofessional inter primary care teams. Speaker, and then this year's budget, we expanded Order. that to $546 million over the next three years to ensure that 600,000 Ontarians have access to primary care. Speaker, we'll continue to make the investments that are needed to ensure that all people of Ontario have access to the care that they need when they need it. The final supplementary. Speaker, follow along, I'd say to the government member opposite, follow along. 2.3 million Ontarians without a family physician in this province. People are going to emergency rooms and finding out that they have cancer, not only that they have cancer, but that it has metastasized. People are showing up in our emergency rooms when they're open, sicker than ever before. This government, if they are recruiting any physicians, we can't keep them. They are leaving faster than we can recruit them. The Minister of Health said last week, this is not a major concern for her government. I want to hear from the Premier himself, who is sitting right here today. I want to hear him speak to this. Do you stand? By your comments, do you stand by your minister's comments, or are you going to remove her from Government her side, role? Government side, come to order. Are you going to remove this minister of health from her role for those insensitive comments?
the Premier. Wants to hear from me. I'll, I'll tell the opposition leader, as she Order. sat in this house with the support of the Liberals, fired, let me repeat that, fired 1,700 people, and you support it. 1,700 nurses. Again, as, 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 a, as a great member said, as a great member said, that we have put in over three over 300 million dollars in investment for uh, not only pediatric care but 546 million for 600,000 Ontarians to match them up with primary care but that's not all we did we're making sure we're building medical universities that again neither of your parties have ever built in 30 years your Order. university, they're going to graduate primary care doctors. Yeah, yeah. The Brampton University, they're going to focus on primary care doctors. University of Toronto is going to focus on primary care doctors. As our great Spons. member said, over 12,500 doctors have been hired and registered and working here in Ontario yeah, yeah. since we've been in office. 80,000 nurses, 30,000. Thank you. Thank you. The member for Waterloo will come to order. The member for Renfrew, Nipissing, Pembroke will come to order. The next question, the Leader of the Opposition. Speaker, the Premier may want to talk to the family doctors who have a petition going right now to have that health minister fired. <laughs> Speaker, in spite of this government's claim of historic spending and education, the Ontario Public School Board Association has said this year's funding is the lowest level of per-student funding in more than a decade. They warn that these funding shortfalls are going to be felt in classrooms. Since this government came into office, it's not only family physicians and nurses and PSWs that we're losing, we are also losing and we have lost 5,000 educators. So my question to the Premier is, will he commit today to reversing these historic cuts to education? Order. The Minister of Education. Mr. Speaker, we have hired 3,000 additional educators under our Premier's leadership. 9,000 additional education workers, as confirmed by the school boards in the province of Ontario. We've added a 22 per cent increase in funding when compared to the former Liberals billions of additional dollars in public expenditure. But, Speaker, this goes back to the refrain of the Leader of the Opposition. In order to achieve, according to her, the benchmark of success is, is investing dollars, as if that is the only way by which we can improve outcomes for kids, one of which was delivering stability for four years of peace for children in Ontario. That delivers a better outcome for our kids. Mr. Speaker, we reverted to merit-based hiring. Common sense should prevail, making sure the best educator is hired for when we teach our kids. We've made a variety of curriculum reforms to instill math Spons. and literacy and core, and core fundamental skills back in the curriculum. That's how we lift standards in Ontario. Supplementary question. Speaker, the minister should do the math. His budget doesn't take inflation into account. Let me be perfectly clear. A budget that ignores inflation is a budget that ignores reality. This is a reality, Speaker, where the cost of a computer a year ago is not the same that it is today. The difference, well, Mr. Speaker, order. that is called a shortfall. A $1,500 shortfall for each and every student in this province and our children and our parents are feeling it. In Greater Essex, math and English help are on the chopping block. In Peel, specialized communications classes and literary coaches, gone. So my question again to the Premier is, how much more support are our kids supposed to give up? Minister of Education. Mr. Speaker, we are increasing funding for the coming school year by $745 million, another example of our government's long-standing commitment to invest more but also to expect more from our school boards so that we actually lift standards on reading, writing and math. Mr. Speaker, we've added thousands of additional educators, thousands, 9,000 no less, additional education workers, even though the student population has largely been flat. Having said that, Speaker, funding per pupil is up to 13,852. In our rural communities, it's over $15,000. In our northern communities, it's over $19,000 per child. In our French school boards, it's over $22,000 per child. We are increasing investments, but we're also hold, holding school boards to account to demand better outcomes on the fundamental skills. That's what parents expect in this province. The final supplementary. 
Speaker, it has never been this bad in the province of Ontario before. That is the fact. That is a reality. When schools face cuts, it's the kids who are the most vulnerable who are going to suffer the most. That's the truth. Westdale in Hamilton lost their breakfast program. That's on this government, Speaker. These supports are not just add-ons. They play an absolutely essential role in a children's mental health, in their confidence. A kid who, doesn't, who goes to school hungry, they're not going to be able to do as well. They're not going to be able to concentrate in class. We all know that as parents. We're going to debate a motion later on today to get things right. Will the Premier, the Premier sitting right there, support our Opposition Day motion today to ensure that every Order. child receives the high-quality education they deserve, regardless of their family's income? The members will please take their seats. The order, order, order. The Minister of Children, Community and Social Services. Well, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Speaker, and thanks to, to the Leader of the Opposition for the question. Mr. Speaker, with the order. rising cost of... Mr. Speaker, with the rise of cost of everything in our province, Order. it's this Premier and this government that showed leadership, Mr. Yeah. Speaker. We increased investment in the student nutrition program by more than $6 million across the province, Mr. Speaker. That brings the total investment to more than $38 million, Mr. Speaker. That is an increase of more than 20 per cent for the Leader of the Official Opposition, Mr. Speaker. And the lead agency that provides the student nutrition program, the City of Hamilton, received an additional allocation of $525,000 this year, Mr. Okay. Speaker, bringing their total investment Response. to more than $3 million. So, Mr. Speaker, we've also worked with other partners, and those partners are also spe stepping up. Mr. Speaker, it was this Premier. It was this government, because the previous government, supported by the NDP, never supported students. Never. Please take a seat. Member for Hamilton Mountain will come to order. The member for Waterloo will come to order. Please stop the clock. I have to interrupt question period to say once again, it has long been the established practice of this House that members should not use props, signage or accessories that are intended to express a political message or are likely to cause disorder. This also extends to members' attire where logos, symbols, slogans and other political messaging are not permitted unless the House grants unanimous consent. This legislature is a forum for debate and the expectations in the Chamber are that political statements should, not be should be made during debate rather than through the use of props or symbols. I must ask the member for Hamilton Centre to come to order. I must warn the member for Hamilton Centre. I will now name the member. Sarah Jama, you are named. The member is currently not eligible to be recognized in the House pursuant to the order adopted on October 23, 2023. As a result of being named for the remainder of the day today, the member is ineligible to vote on matters before the Assembly, attend and participate in any committee proceedings, use the media studio, and table notices of motion, written questions, and petitions. Sarah Jama, you must leave the chamber for the day. Order. Start the clock. The next question. The member for Toronto, St. Paul's. It's been over two years since 28,000 actual members have been locked out of the National Commercial Agreement by the ICA. ICA walked out on negotiations. This illegal lockout has been propped up by this government, hiring of union-busting agencies, ad agencies, to create ads that further stab actual members in the back by using non-unionized replacement workers. 
pitting workers against one another, Speaker. Speaker, there are over a hundred, a hundred ACTRA members here today advocating. They're actually fighting for their livelihood. The question is to the Premier. Will the Premier, Minister of Labour and Culture attend the We Rise Up rally here today at Queen's Park and hear how their illegal lockout is affecting actual workers, help get ICA back to the table to negotiate, stop using union-busting ad agencies, and support our Bill 90 to protect these workers, some of the most Question. precarious workers in Ontario? Stand up and save the workers. Thank you. I remind the members to make their comments through the chair, Minister of Labour, Immigration, Training and Skills Development. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you, Speaker. And I want to thank the ACTRA members who are here today. Uh, Speaker, I had a, a good conversation with a number of them prior to question period. Uh, Speaker, I, I think um, important to note, while I did mention to them, and I will say to the members opposite, uh, this uh, dispute is currently before the Ontario Labour Relations Board, which is a quasi-judicial body, and I know that that member uh, wouldn't act, ask me to interfere in that work. Having said that, having s if she let me finish, she I get to my next order. And thank you, Speaker. And that is, I recognize that Destination Ontario, Metrolinx, and OLG. Uh, do uh, seek advertising services, and I'm going to be calling after question period uh, the heads of all three uh, agency speaker, um, and I look forward uh, to having a conversation with them because I recognize that Bonds. government does have a role here. Thank you, Speaker. Order. Supplementary question, the member for Sudbury. Thank you, Speaker. The question is also for the Premier. Speaker, for more than two years, thousands of actor Toronto performers have been locked out by the Institute of Canadian Agencies. And for more than two years, the Conservative government has continued to use taxpayer dollars to buy government ads from the advertising agencies who have locked out these workers. And for more than two years, I have asked the Premier several times to stand with these workers and stop buying these ads. He keeps failing them, Speaker. It's been 25 months, more than two years. Enough is enough. My question, Speaker, is will the Premier finally side with a thousand of actual commercial workers, stop buying government funding ads from the advertising agencies who locked up these workers? Not just a phone call, but stop buying them, stop supporting them, get on the side of these workers. Minister of Labour. Thank you, Speaker. Again, uh, Speaker, I you know, I think it's, it is very important uh, to maintain uh, the independence of the Ontario Labour Relations Board. I'm uh, the arbiter of the system, not the adjudicator. However, I recognize, as I've said in my first answer, I recognize uh, that government and, and the subsequent agencies uh, you know, and, and the ads that they're hiring are uh, having an impact, Speaker, and that's why I'm going to be calling all three uh, agencies following question period, Speaker, um, because we want a deal here uh, between uh, both bodies. I recognize the important work that Chair O'Byrne and the OLRB are doing, uh, but I also recognize uh, the perception here with these three agencies, and so we'll be speaking with them after question period. Thank you, Speaker. Question, the member for Oakville. Thank you very much, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Energy. During a period of rising costs and high interest rates, it's important for all governments to find, make life more affordable for the people of Ontario. But, Speaker, the Liberal carbon tax is making life more difficult for Ontarians. I keep hearing from people in my riding of Oakville about how much their gas and grocery bills have increased on a regular basis since the implementation of this tax. They're concerned about how much more it will cost to feed their families and whether they can continue to take their kids to hockey, baseball or soccer practice. That's simply unacceptable. The federal Liberals and their provincial counterparts need to listen to what we've been saying from day one and stop the carbon tax. Speaker. Can the minister please explain how the Liberal carbon tax is creating financial hardship for everyone here in the province of Ontario? Great question. Minister of Energy. Uh, speaker, it's no surprise to anyone, especially the member from Oakville, that the federal Liberal government's carbon tax is making life more expensive for the people of Ontario and the people of Canada, and that's why we're taking a different route, Mr. Speaker. We're procuring clean energy. Just last week, I was down at the Power of Water Canada conference in Niagara, announcing a new small hydro program, a new northern hydro program, Mr. Speaker, for 10 megawatt facilities and larger. It's why I was in 
Cornwall with the great member from Stormont, Dundas, South Glengarry, on Friday announcing that we were refurbishing the Saunders Dam, huge facility connecting Lake Ontario and the Great Lakes system uh, to the Atlantic Ocean and providing uh, electricity, clean electricity for over a million homes in our province, and that work has started to refurbish that facility. Last week was a busy week when it comes to procuring clean energy for our province, Mr. Yeah. Speaker. The one thing that our Powering Ontario's Spons. growth plan doesn't include, Mr. Speaker, is a carbon tax yeah. because we don't need it. All it does is punish the people of Ontario. Supplementary question back to the member for Oakville. Thank you, Speaker, and uh, thank you very much, Minister, for the response. Really appreciate it. The carbon tax is burdening Ontario families that are already struggling to make ends meet. But, Speaker, the Liberals in this legislature, much like their federal counterparts, want to see this tax hike even higher. Wow. Ontario families and businesses need relief, and they need it now. Unlike the carbon tax queen Bonnie Crombie and her minivan caucus, our government is focused on making life more affordable for the people of Ontario. It's time the federal government do their part to get rid of the carbon tax once and for all. Speaker, can the minister explain what our government is doing to protect the people of this province from the costly carbon tax? Minister of Energy. Mr. Speaker, we're not imposing a carbon tax. The NDP and the Queen of the Carbon Tax, Bonnie Crombie, the leader of the Liberal Party, and uh, Mr. Schreiner here, the leader of the Green Party, they're all in support. They're all in support of a carbon tax, Mr. Speaker. There's only one party in this legislature that's opposed to a carbon tax, and that's Premier Ford and our team. Instead, we're doing the kinds of things that I talked about earlier, procuring new, clean, non-emitting generation, and that includes refurbishing our nuclear facilities that we have across the province, including at Pickering and at Darlington and at Bruce, building small modular reactors at Darlington, Mr. Speaker. And last week, we had the largest procurement in Canada's history for clean energy storage, Mr. Speaker. Another 1,800 megawatts is being added right across our province Spons. to ensure that our system remains clean and reliable. Our plan for powering Ontario's growth, which is working, does order. And we will take a seat. I remind the members to refer to each other by our riding name or ministerial title as applicable. The next question, the member for Nickel Belt. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Thank you, Members Speaker. The Nurse Practitioners Association came to Queen's Park today. They came to share solutions with the Minister of Health for the 2.3 million Ontarians without access to primary care. They are ready, willing, and able to care for thousands of or orphan patients. Unfortunately, although all 24 nurse practitioner led clinics are willing to help, they represent only four of the 78 teams announced by the Minister. Will the Minister listen? To the solution brought forward by NPAO, open positions for nurse practitioner and give Ontarian access to primary care. Parliamentary Assistant Member for Stormont Dundas, South Glengarry. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member opposite for the question. Speaker, we have invested significantly into primary care. We invested $110 million, and we've topped that investment with another $546 million over the next three years to expand to another 600,000 Ontarians to have primary care. Speaker, we've also expanded the Learn and Stay grant, which pays for tuition, pays for the books, pays for supplies for nurses and other health care workers who work in underserved areas after graduation. Speaker, we're also funding the largest expansion of medical school spots in over a decade, adding 1,212 undergraduate and 1,637 postgraduate seats across Ontario. Speaker, 60 per cent of these spots will be dedicated to family medicine. We're building a new medical school in York University, specializing in training family physicians. And speaker, we have a plan to rebuild Ontario's health care, and we won't stop until everyone receives the care that they need when and where. Speaker. In the supplementary. Speaker, by the time some, some of those uh, suggestions are put forward, it will be a decade. By, by 2026, 4 million Ontarians won't have access to primary care, but yet we have nurse practitioners right here, right now in Ontario. Their scope of practice has increased substantially. They can order diagnostic imaging, they can provide treatment. They have been very successful with that extra work, with these extra responsibility. Yet, nurse practitioners in primary care, in long-term care, in correctional services have not seen a salary increase since this government has been in power. Oh. 
When will the minister start showing respect for the hardworking nurse practitioner and, at a minimum, uh, close the salary gap between nurse practitioner in hospital and other care settings? Minister Stormont, Dundas, South and Gary. Speaker, with our recent expansion, we already have a nurse practitioner working in the Minto area under MPP Ray's uh, jurisdiction. Speaker, we will continue to invest in Ontarians to, to ensure that they have the care they need. With the $543 million advance uh, in this year's budget, we are going to expand it to 600,000 more people. Speaker, under the Liberals, propped up by the NDP, they cut the amount of residency school spots. We are a thousand uh, doctors short uh, combined between the NDP and the Liberals when they cut the residency school spots by 10 percent and 50 spots under the Liberals. Speaker, we will continue to ensure that the people of Ontario have the health care they need when and where they need it. Speaker, right now, currently, almost 90 percent of Ontarians have a family care doctor or primary care health team. Speaker, but we know there's more that needs to be done, and we will continue Response. doing what needs to be done to ensure that all people of Ontario have the health care they need, whether it's in the north, east, west, or south. Thank you, Speaker. The next question, the member for Windsor to come see. Thank you, Speaker. And uh, my question is for the Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade. The Trudeau Liberals continue to hike taxes and raise costs, despite businesses and workers pleading to them to stop. You would think that when people are struggling to deal with higher costs, governments would act to lower costs and provide relief as our government has done. But instead, the Liberal solution to higher costs is to make things even more expensive with their carbon tax. They're running the same playbook as Ontario's previous Liberal government, but it seems they haven't asked them how it worked out for our province, and particularly for my communities of Windsor and Tecumseh. Speaker, can the Minister explain to the Liberals why keeping costs low is crucial for economic growth? Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade. Speaker, if the Liberals need any proof that lowering taxes and reducing costs create the conditions for economic growth, they can look right here at Ontario. In April, Ontario led the nation in job creation, adding 25,000 new good paying jobs, including 5,800 new jobs in our manufacturing sector. Speaker, manufacturing employment is now at its highest level in 15 years. That's what happens when you lower taxes and reduce 500 pieces of red tape. Now, can you just imagine if the Liberals came along with us and reduced taxes instead of adding taxes like they're doing? We are showing the Liberals the way, and we need them to come around to our side and scrap the tax today. Supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Speaker, and uh, thank you, Minister, for the response. Uh, Ontario's economy is in a much different place today than it was under the Liberals. 700,000 more men and women are working today than before we took office. But businesses and workers in my riding of Windsor Tecumseh have not forgotten how devastating the Liberals' high tax policies were for our economy. We need the federal government to recognize that the Liberal experiment of high tax policies has repeatedly been tested and has failed each and every time. At 17 cents a litre, the carbon tax is already putting a strain on household budgets while forcing businesses to make difficult choices. Can the minister explain why the Liberals should scrap their carbon tax and focus on measures that reduce costs, not raise them? Yeah. Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade. Speaker, when we took office, we knew we had to lower costs so we could bring back the businesses who left under the Liberals. Now, companies around the world now know Ontario is open for business. The new listing of all active cranes in North America just came out, and Toronto is leading North America. We have 221 active cranes. Now, to put it in perspective, that is more cranes than all 12 major U.S. cities combined. That's the power of what's happening here in Ontario, and that's what happens when you lower taxes. We need the federal Liberals to follow our lead and scrap the carbon tax. Thank you. The next question, the member for Humber River, Black Creek. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. 
Speaker, the public still remembers the bread price-fixing scandal where grocers reached a secret agreement to inflate the cost of bread for more than 14 years. They said they were sorry, but since then, big corporations' profits continue to reach all-time highs while Ontarians' monthly budgets get tighter and shrinkflation means we're literally getting less for our money. Speaker, something just doesn't smell right in Ontario's grocery stores. Can the Premier tell Ontarians what he's doing to hold big corporations accountable and put a stop to price gouging? The Minister of Finance. Well, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, to, through you to the member opposite for that question. Mr. Speaker, um, I know the member opposite follows our budgets very closely. That's why back in 2022, this government acted early yeah. to combat the affordability crisis by cutting the gas tax with that measure, along with others, 10 cents a litre, Mr. Speaker. And guess what? You know, cutting the gas tax doesn't just help all those people who have to can't take subways or public transit who have to take their kids to school or drive to work or get to the, to the hockey rink. It helps the people who grow the food, right. Mr. Speaker. It helps the people who grow and the great farmers in this great province. You know, Mr. Speaker, you also have to distribute the food yeah. to get to the distribution centers, Mr. Speaker. That costs money, gas money, and we've reduced that. You know, in fact, what you should do is go call one— Response. I, I'll stop there. But one uh, Jagmeet Singh up in Ottawa and get them to lobby the federal government to cut the carp. Supplementary question. Speaker, this government has been way too close for comfort to the big corporations, but Ontarians are fed up with this government taking the side of mega corporations that only blame inflation and the carbon tax as the sole reasons for the skyrocketing cost of groceries. The public sees through it. It's time to stop cozying up to powerful billionaires and start taking a much closer look at their business practices. Right. Speaker, what is the Premier doing to investigate price gouging and make sure Ontarians aren't getting ripped off on groceries? Minister of Finance. Mr. Speaker, not only this government got the backs of all the people working in this province to make life a little bit more affordable, guess what? This government is not about increasing taxes. This government is about putting more money in the pockets of the hardworking people of Ontario. This is a government that believes in cutting fees. Do you remember those license plate stickers? Well, they're done, they're gone, right, Premier? They're done, they're gone putting 120 bucks for those who have to drive, Mr. Speaker. But it doesn't stop there. One fare from this minister. One integrated fare for the Daily Rider. That's saving up to $1,600 a year. That's real money so they can buy groceries, pay the rent, pay the mortgage, and yes, pay for gas, which is now over 10 cents a litre cheaper because this government took action and took action early. It's time. You know, we're going to be voting on the budget very soon, Mr. Speaker. I would like to implore this member opposite and the whole team to support our <laughs> member for Hamilton Mountain come to order. 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 The next question, the member for Ottawa South. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, uh, my question is for the Premier. We all know that we have the most expensive Premier's office in the history of this province by far. The premier, the premier has doubled the budget and tripled the number of staff that have six-figure salaries. That's right, Speaker, triple. So their average salary is more than double the median family income. That's right, Speaker, double the Member median for family income. To order. So, Speaker, at a time when Ontario families are just struggling to keep their heads above the water. This Premier and his office, they're swimming in gravy. So, Speaker, through you, when will this Premier stop the gravy train that is his office? Government House Leader. Speaker, let me tell you, the most expensive Premier's office in the history of this province was the one that preceded this government, the Kathleen Wynne Premier's office. You know why? 
Order. Because it cost us 300,000 jobs, Mr. Speaker. It cost us massive amounts of economic development. It cost us job creation. It cost us trade. It hurt our students. Remember when our students were discovering math instead of learning math? That was under the previous Liberal government. You know all of those doctors that aren't practicing right now? That was because they closed the medical schools instead of thinking about it 15 years ago, Mr. Speaker. They the closed the medical schools. They didn't hire nurses. They laid them off. We built long-term care homes. We're building more hospitals. We're building roads, transportation. 700,000 people have the dignity of a job that didn't under the previous Liberal government, Mr. Speaker. So that member can talk about Response. gravy train all he wants, but the only thing we're doing is building an economy out of the ashes of what was left behind by the previous Liberal government. The supplementary. Despite that answer, they're still swimming in gravy, Speaker. Yeah. Speaker, this gravy train it doesn't actually end in the Premier's office. It the runs right the, through it. The P and come to order. It's like a return trip. This time, as a lobbyist, yeah. Premier's former chief of staff, Amin Masoudi. Yeah. You know, uh, he is famous for what uh, that Vegas trip. We all remember. We don't have the story quite straight yet. But here's the thing. Here's the thing, as if that Greenbelt gravy wasn't enough for Mr. Masoudi, we learned last week that he tried to engage the town of Brighton in a lucrative contract to lobby the Premier's office. So it was only after he got caught with his hand in the cookie jar that he declined the contract. So, Speaker, if the Premier won't stop the gravy train that is his office, could he at least stop it from running right through it, Premier? Thank you. The member for Nepean. The member for Nepean come to order. The member for Hamilton Mountain come to order. The member for Ottawa South come to order. The Premier can reply. Mr. Speaker, I, I just find it very ironic coming from that member when he bankrupt the province. Shame. He lost 300,000 jobs, and the largest expense ever, ever, was under Kathleen Wynne. Just a little FYI, my friend. Just a little FYI through the Speaker. I'm the only premier in the history of this province has never expensed a penny, not one penny, not a chocolate bar, Remember not a Coca-Cola, nothing, on. zero. The only premier in the history of this province that has never expensed anything. Number four, Hamilton Mountain will come to order. Order. Okay. I'm going. Order. Premier, come to order. Member for Ottawa South, come to order. The next question, the member for Mississauga Centre. Thank you so much, Speaker. Good morning. My question is for the Energetic Minister of Energy. Speaker. The federal carbon tax is raising the cost of everything heating, eating, driving, and even recreation. Yes, Justin Trudeau and Carbon Crombie want to tax your family for simply having some fun. So, unsurprisingly, this is also forcing businesses to pay more taxes. Speaker, it is clear that the carbon tax is punishing the very people it claims to protect our families, our businesses, and our future generations. And that's simply not acceptable. Speaker, can the minister please tell the House how our government is providing Ontarians with clean, affordable energy as we fight against this disastrous carbon tax? The Minister of Energy. Thanks uh, very much to the great member from Mississauga Centre for the question today. She's absolutely right. The federal carbon tax is driving up the price of everything in our province, and the Bank of Canada has confirmed that it's even having an impact on inflation in our province, Mr. Speaker. And the queen of the carbon tax, Bonnie Crombie, the former mayor of Mississauga, supports the federal carbon tax. The NDP want to have the largest carbon tax in the land, Mr. Speaker, and the Greens are in full support of a carbon tax as well. We're not. Premier Ford and our team are making life less expensive by cutting gas taxes, bringing in one fare for our transit riders in Mississauga and other communities 
across the GTHA, cutting tolls, cutting taxes, Mr. Speaker. We're about making life more affordable and making this a friendly business environment. Now, the carbon tax, the member talked about the impact that it's having on businesses. There are $1.3 billion owed to small businesses as a result of the carbon tax in our province. That money has yet to flow to them, Mr. Speaker. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for his response. It is shameful that the opposition, NDP, and the minivan Liberals continue to support this harmful tax as they see the federal Liberals reach deeper into people's pockets. They don't have a plan, Speaker, to improve affordability and the cost of living in Ontario. All they care about is pushing their agenda and raising our taxes, just like Carbon Crombie did every single year when she was a mayor. No wonder, Speaker, that Mississauga's population actually shrunk under Carbon Crombie's leadership. Speaker, Ontario families are feeling the squeeze. They want a federal government to scrap the carbon tax now. Speaker, can the minister please explain what our government is doing to protect Ontarians from the costly carbon tax? Mr. Of Energy. Uh, thanks to the great member again from Mississauga for that follow-up question. There's a reason that we call her the queen of the carbon tax, not that member, uh, but the leader of the Liberal Party, uh, Mr. Speaker, Bonnie Crombie, who has raised taxes in Mississauga, but is, is also in full support of a tax that is making life unaffordable for the people of Ontario. And the NDP support that tax as well. The Greens support that tax as well. Oh. We don't. We can clean. We already have one of the cleanest grids in the entire world, but we can continue to clean that grid, grow that grid, so we can grow businesses in our province by investing in nuclear, Mr. Speaker, which we're doing at Bruce and at Darlington and at Pickering, but also refurbishing our hydroelectric fleets that we have across the province energy efficiency programs, a billion dollars in that program, Speaker, procuring new energy storage. The largest procurement of energy storage happened here in Ontario last week, Response. Mr. Speaker, another 1,800 megawatts there. We can get the power that we need, and we don't need a costly carbon tax. Thank you. The next question, the member for Niagara Falls. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Speaker, on Thursday, I introduced my motion to create a direct financial benefit to unpaid caregivers in the province of Ontario. His support from several advocacy groups, from the Canadian Cancer Society to the Alzheimer's Society to MS Canada. I've heard directly from my constituents, including John, who's a caregiver for his wife, who lives with dementia. John told me he is going through hell, and he said caregivers deserve the recognition from this government. Speaker, will the Premier and his party support my motion to help John and the other 3.3 million caregivers across the province of Ontario? Parliamentary Assistant, Member for Stormont Dundas, South Glengarry. Thank you, Speaker. Our government is making the investments that Ontarians need to ensure that there are options for home care in Ontario. After years of neglect by previous governments, the Liberal government propped up by the NDP, which that member was a, party of, a member of the party, uh, we are investing over a billion dollars into home care, and in this year's budget, we've added another $2 billion to our home care over the next three years. <laughs> Speaker, our landmark investment in home care will ensure that those who choose to stay in their home will be able to stay longer with the care they need. Speaker, as we announced this year in our budget, we are also expanding our primary care, Speaker. We are investing $543 million over the next three years to ensure that over 600,000 Ontarians get the care they need when they need it, Speaker. Speaker, we'll continue to invest in our hospitals by committing close to a billion dollars to ensure that they have the tools they need Response. to provide convenient care close to home. Supplementary. I'll just say that everybody, including everybody on that side, is affected by caregivers in the province of Ontario, and quite frankly, this isn't about Wayne Gates, it's about caregivers. Speaker, and back to the Premier. Speaker, our office has received, received support from people right across the province of Ontario on our motion, including Karen from Grinsby, whose sister is a primary caregiver for her husband who lives with ALS. 
Because of her caregiving responsibilities, she's lost her job, and now they're burning through their savings and struggling to survive. Also heard from Nicole from Scarborough Centre, who can't work because of her caregiving responsibility, but she's not eligible for financial assistance. Speaker, again, will the Premier support my motion to help the 3.3 million caregivers with stories like this right across the province of Ontario? Thank you, Speaker. Interesting enough, yesterday was Mother's Day, so happy belated Mother's Day to everyone. I spoke to my mother, Karen, yesterday about her being a caregiver to both her parents and my father's parents. Speaker, those were some of her best years that she took care of her parents, and she looks back at those years fondly, Speaker. A strong home and community care is part of the government's plan for a connected and convenient care, Speaker. That's why we passed the Convenient Care at Home Act to streamline the home care system. In partnership with hospitals, primary care, and Ontario Health Team, Speaker, Ontario is expanding and improving access to home and community care. Speaker, we're investing $2 billion over the next three years in home care. That is on top of $1 billion over three years in the 2023 budget, Speaker. We are taking bold and innovative action to ensure Ontarians can connect to the care they need, where they need it, and when they need it, Speaker. Thank you. The next question, the member for Thornhill. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Labour, Immigration, Training and Skills Development. So Ontario is seeing an historic labour shortage, with about 300,000 jobs going unfilled. Many of these vacancies are in the skilled trades. Speaker, the labour shortage is impacting the financial well-being of families across Ontario. It increases the cost of items they purchase every day. It disrupts businesses and their supply chains and threatens our economy's stability. And as our province continues to grow, we need all all hands on deck to build Ontario to ensure that our province stays the best place to live, work uh, and play, raise a family. Our government must continue to show leadership and encourage more people to enter the skilled trades. Speaker, can the minister please share what our government is doing to address the labour shortages in the skilled trades? Labour, immigration, training and skills development. Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the great member for Thornhill for that really important question. Uh, speaker, our economic competitiveness does depend on our ability uh, to address the over 100,000 uh, jobs going unfilled in construction alone, Speaker. Um, we also know that we're facing a silver tsunami. What does that mean? One in three journey persons are over uh, the age of 55, and we've got to do more to attract a new workers into the skilled trade, Speaker. It's not only a labour shortage issue, but it also affects our productivity as a province, something we have to work uh, to address, because when we improve our productivity, we can improve our competitiveness as a province. So what are we doing? We've launched a 1.5 billion skilled trade strategy. Our, through our skills development training stream alone, we've trained over 500,000 workers into a better job with a bigger paycheck. We've taken steps to get properly fitted PPE for women in the trades, leading to one of the highest registration years in Ontario's history for women into the skilled trades, tackling uh, barriers for marginalized and racialized Ontarian speaker. We've also uh, launched foreign credential recognition, streamlined pathways, and so much more. I can't even fit it into the answer, Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for his response and his proactive work for the people of Ontario. The demand for skilled workers in the construction and manufacturing sector is set to grow significantly over the next decade. Speaker, many local employers have job vacancies and work opportunities that must be filled. It's never been more important that our government take action to ensure Ontario has the tradespeople needed to build our province. While our government is making progress that helps prepare young people for in-demand careers, there's still more to be done. Speaker, through you, can the Minister of Education please tell the House how our government is making it easier for youth to get on a fast track to well-paying jobs in the skilled trades? Minister of Education. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you, Member from Thornhill, for this important question. We are excited because this coming September, all students will now be required to take at least one technological education course. The first 
jurisdiction in the country to do so. And to prepare for that, we've expanded co-op placements in education. Compared to the Liberals, in 2018, there's been a 189 percent increase of students enrolled in co-op education. We are making the difference of trying to infuse working with learning, and that is the future of work. And in partnership with the Minister of Labour, we have announced the Focus Apprenticeship Skills Training Program, FAST, which allows now students to take to more than double their amount of co-op placements in grade 11 and 12, getting them an accelerated path in all 144 trades. This is going to meaningfully accelerate and supercharge the uh, next generation of skilled workers Spons. in our province, and we're proud to work together to get the job done. The next question, the member for Toronto Centre. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Amir Ramtula, who was the Chief of Staff to the late Mayor Ford, is also the registered lobbyist for the Therme Group. Ontarians and accountability watchdogs widely suspect that this government's Ontario Place plot is just another insider deal. Amir Ramtula has been an insider for so long that he appears on the registry of the Premier's family furniture. And don't forget that he also lobbied this government for the Gasprius Greenbelt grab. So on behalf of everyone wondering, yes or no, simple answer, did lobbying by um, Amir Ramtola help convince the Premier to subsidize the destruction of Ontario Place with hundreds of millions of dollars of taxpayers' money? Um, to reply, the parliamentary assistant and member for Brampton West. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the member opposite for the question. Mr. Speaker, we wouldn't be talking Ontario Place had the Liberals and NDP not left this historic place instead of neglect and disrepair, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, there's no better time to bring this iconic destination back to life, making it a remarkable world-class destination for people of all ages to enjoy. Mr. Speaker, you know, our government believes in getting things done and built, not neglected like opposition and liberals, Mr. Speaker. That is why we remain committed to the people of this province that we will be doing the comprehensive redevelopment of Ontario Place and we will bring it back to life, Mr. Speaker. And, Mr. Speaker, good news to share is that, Mr. Speaker, we have recently, uh, Infrastructure Ontario has issued a request for qualifications to begin the procurement process to identify a team uh, that will design, build, finance, and maintain the new state of the art facility for the Ontario Science Centre, Mr. Speaker. We are getting things done, Mr. Speaker. Speaker, this government's transparency on this issue is as thick as fog. But as a former Toronto City Councillor, I want to ask the Premier a question which I know that he knows the answer to. When I look at the Thermes Ontario Place plan, I cannot get over that the business model is flawed, something we've seen before. It reminds me of another bad plan about reckless development on the waterfront. When Amir Remtula worked for then-Mayor Ford, there was a nonsensical plan to build a downtown casino at Ontario Place. Building a downtown mega casino was championed by the mayor and his brother, now the premier. Once Ontario Place is rezoned for commercial and entertainment uses, there's little that anyone can do to stop them from flipping the land lease for another use, perhaps a casino operator. What does this government really hope to see happen in Ontario Place when Thermae Spa deals fall apart? For Brampton West. Uh, Mr. Speaker, we have been transparent and open to public when it comes to the future of Ontario Place, and the fact is that we have hosted extensive public consultations, and I'm pleased to share with the House, Mr. Speaker, that over 9,200 people participated in the consultation to share their inputs and ideas on the future of Ontario Place. Mr. Speaker, we believe that the government has done its due diligence, and now is the time to bring this iconic destination back to life. Unlike Liberals and NDP, Mr. Speaker, who neglected this place, Mr. Speaker, Ontario Place has a special spot in the hearts and minds of the people of this province, and people only trust this government because this government is building infrastructure, not only building hospitals, schools, Highway 413, Mr. Speaker. We are bringing remarkable destinations and historic places like Ontario Place and Science Centre. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you very much. The next question, the member for Newmarket, Aurora. 
Thank you, Speaker. And my question is for the Associate Minister of Small Business. Small businesses are the backbone of our economy, employing millions of workers across various sectors. I am proud to be part of a government that has the backs of business owners and stands to support them every step of the way. But, Speaker, Many of our small businesses, including in my riding of Newmarket Aurora, are facing significant uncertainty and cost pressures due to the impact of the Liberal carbon tax and recent federal budget only fanned the flames by adding even more taxes to Ontario's entrepreneurs. And that's not right, Mr. Speaker. Speaker, through you, Question. can the Associate Minister please tell the House what small business owners across Ontario have to say about the costly Liberal carbon tax? The Associate Minister of Small Business. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the great member from Newmarket, Aurora, for the question. Speaker, I've taken part in roundtables with entrepreneurs and small businesses owners across this province, and I can say with certainty that the concerns they've expressed about the federal carbon tax is deeply troubling. Speaker, it's disappointing to see that the recent federal budget did not take meaningful action to address all of these concerns. Instead, the Liberals have added additional taxes, which only compounded the challenges these small businesses are facing. I've heard time and time again that small business owners feel abandoned by the federal government and the Ontario Liberals and NDP, who've refused to stand up for them to their friends in Ottawa. Speaker, I know Bonnie Crombie and the Liberals have never seen a tax hike they didn't like, Response. but we're not standing down. It's time for Ottawa to scrap the tax. Supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the Associate Minister for her response. I know that people in my riding appreciate our government's continued advocacy for Ontario's small business owners. Speaker, now more than ever, entrepreneurs and innovators are looking to governments to help them, not hinder them as they continue driving innovation, job creation and economic growth. But it seems like the federal Liberals are copying the high-tax environment which saw their provincial counterparts wiped out from party status in 2018. Speaker, through you, can the Associate Minister explain why the federal carbon tax is hurting entrepreneurs and innovators' ability to Question. start, grow and invest in their businesses? The Associate Minister of Small Business. Thank you, Speaker, and again to the member for her question. The recent federal budget was terrible for entrepreneurs, with measures like increased taxes drawing harsh criticism from groups like the Canadian Council of Innovators. Our job creators tell me these tax hikes will, and I quote, stifle growth and demotivate Canadians from getting into business in the first place. Speaker, they're telling me they're grateful that our government is pushing back against these job-killing measures and supporting our province's job creators. But with gas prices, interest rates, fuel costs and energy rates going up because of the carbon tax, they're having to make tough decisions when looking to start a business. So, Speaker, you can thank a Liberal the next time a young, bright mind has a groundbreaking idea, a solid business plan and support Response. from our province that then decides it's too expensive to get their business off the ground. Still, Speaker, this Premier and our government will continue to stand short. Thank you very much. Thank you. The member for Ottawa West, McKeon. Thank you, Speaker. It's been six years now since my constituents paid deposits to Great Wise Developments for new homes and construction has still not started. A year ago, I raised this issue in the House, and the government responded that they were putting bad developers on notice, making them think twice before taking advantage of home buyers. And yet, while homes are going up all over Ottawa right now, this developer hasn't even prepared the land to start construction. Why is the Premier allowing a bad developer to hold home buyers hostage with no consequences at all? Public and business service delivery. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. The question raises the important role of both Terrion 
which provides deposit protection uh, for uh, new home buyers of uh, freehold homes, and of course the other administrative agency which our government created in its first term after inheriting a broken administrative authority system for new home buyers from the Liberal government supported by the NDP. And with the, the uh, Home Construction Regulatory Authority, we can regulate home builders, we can weed out the bad actors, we can protect consumers. So the combination of the two administrative authorities demonstrates that the system definitely works. It's about consumer protection, specifically for those freehold home buyers, making sure their deposits are protected and the bad actors are put out of business. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Supplementary. The Home Construction Regulatory Authority has done nothing 34 months after my home, the constituents in my riding first filed a complaint. The Premier's refused a meeting request from my constituents. If this is what consequences look like for behaving badly, Speaker, then no wonder developers are brazenly refusing to build years after collecting deposits. When will we finally see real action, not just words, from this government to hold bad developers accountable so families like my constituents finally get a home in Ontario? Minister of Public and Business Service Delivery. The leadership of Premier Ford continues to lead this province toward the goal of building 1.5 million homes by 2031. And yet, we had to act quickly. We inherited from the Liberals a system condemned by the Auditor General. It was a system that favoured the interests of developers over homeowners. It was this government that acted, that stopped the sponsored industry dinners. It was this government that created HICRA, the Home Construction Regulatory Authority, and it was this government that limited Tarion's board to incorporate no more than a third of developers. We're getting it done for the people and consumers of Ontario, Mr. Speaker. Thank you very much. Question the member for Thunder Bay, Atacoke. Happy, happy Monday, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Indigenous Affairs and Northern Development. The carbon tax is exasperating financial strain for all Ontarians. Communities across northern Ontario continue to face heightened economic challenges, notably at the gas pumps as a result of this punitive tax. The cost of transporting goods is already much higher in northern Ontario, and these costs are being passed on to the consumer. But, Speaker, the federal Liberals are not listening. In fact, they just increased the carbon tax last month by 23% with plans to hike the tax an additional six times by 2030. That's simply unacceptable. Speaker, could the minister provide further details about how, adverse, how the carbon tax adversely impacts residents in Northern Ontario? Minister of Northern Development, Minister of Indigenous Affairs. The carbon tax royal love story keeps getting more and more complicated and frankly the king of the carbon tax prime minister trudeau needs to rein it in now we know he's got the support of the queen of the carbon tax over there and jagmeet singh continues to vacillate but there's new there's a new player mr speaker prince carney otherwise known as mark carney has decided that this tax has run its course now i suspect that that lines up perfectly with how canadians feel about the tax and his uh, prospect of replacing uh, the Prime Minister, Mr. Speaker, simply put, uh, we have a more ironic solution, and that is to scrap the tax. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. That concludes our question period for this morning. Pursuant to Standing Order 36A, the member for